directions in which there is a little bit more to do. So uh, in that sense, it's interesting. So let me begin by talking about defect conformal field theory a little bit. All right, so we have this picture that uh, we have uh, space-time, four-dimensional, say, which uh, is uh, filled up with some conformal field theory, like n equals four. And then we ruin that conformal field theory a little bit by putting a defect in. But some conformal symmetry and supersymmetry survive, so it is still a superconformal uh, field theory of some sort. So inside here is n equals four. On the defect is some defect theory, like the one we've been talking about, although we don't have to be that specific about it. Then what happens here is, well, there's a position of the defect. The conformal symmetry is smaller. The Poincaré symmetry is smaller than it was in the full bulk theory before we put the defect there. Uh, since these symmetries are smaller, they are less powerful. They determine less than they used to. Uh, maybe that makes it less interesting because we can do less, but there are some interesting additional things that we couldn't uh, do before. So in order to figure out what they are, let me uh, uh, define some things. So if we have some uh, operators, let me denote them like this. Uh, yeah. A generic operator in the bulk I'll call O sub i. And a generic operator uh, on the defect I'll call O sub i with a hat over it. Now, the bulk operators are just the operators of n equals 4, the local operators you could make by taking products of fields, and we'll use some examples of them. On the defect, also, you can take n equals 4 operators and place them on the defect. For purposes here, I think of those as being independent of the bulk operators. Right? One should study the bulk operators that comes up to the defect, but that's usually something fairly singular, so you sort of think of the bulk operator living on the defect is, as an independent operator. Won't go very much into the technical details of exactly what that all means, as uh, we'll have something else to do here. And these operators, I will assume, are uh, the usual scaling operators. In that, there's a dilatation operator which is residual here, dilates the whole system. And this is true for either kind. So without the hat or with the hat. Where, of course, the x mu d mu is modified in the appropriate way because with the hat, of course, the derivatives should be taken inside the defect, sort of tangential to the defect, uh, whereas outside they can be in any direction. The new thing that can happen here is if you take the operators outside, You know, aside from the other usual thing of uh, conformal field theory getting more complicated, there's one thing that's quite simple and that's new here, and that's that a scaling operator, if it has the right symmetries, can have a one-point function. And down here should be the distance from the defect which, let me call it y. I'm afraid I have many z's in my notes. 
for meaning several different things. Let me call it y here. And that's to the power of the dimension of the operator. Now, not all operators will have a one-point function. Operators will transform under symmetries other than the scaling symmetry. And it could be that, th in that case, symmetry uh, requires that this expectation value is zero. So many will still be zero, but some could survive, and those are the ones that are invariant under the residual symmetries of the defect field theory. Okay, so this is the new feature. The other features, which let me just review them a little bit. Well, actually, there's another feature that survives. It just survives more or less unchanged, and that's the operator product expansion for operators in the bulk. Of course, if operators come really close to each other out in the bulk, away from the defect, the short distance singularity shouldn't really care about the presence of the defect, and in fact, it doesn't. And one could add that, uh, in a sense, uh, some more equations for operator product expansions where defect or where bulk operators approach the defect and defect operators approach each other, and so on. So there are a bunch of those things. Uh, since I'm not going to use them, I won't uh, take the time to write them down. Uh, Let's see, there are a few other things. Well, what is why? Uh, just a minute. Let me define it here. So this is the point x. Why is this distance here? Okay, so we insert this operator out here. And typically, maybe uh, one could write x mu as some um, vector part of x, which is a vector in the coordinates of the defect, and then a distance from the defect. Big delta is the conformal dimension of the operator defined by this equation. So if there were no defect, <coughs> conformal symmetry would tell you that this operator has to have zero expectation value unless its conformal dimension were zero. But only the unit operator can have conformal dimension zero. All local operators have conformal dimensions that are bounded from below by a unitarity bound. For scalar operators, that bound is dimension one right, in four dimensions. Uh, it's actually the lower the unitarity bound on co conformal dimensions is the dimension of a free field with the given spin. Good. Yeah, so there is an R symmetry. And that R symmetry, could it still average this to zero? It, it could, yeah, generally, yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, uh, there is R symmetry. This, of course, will only happen when the defect reduces the R symmetry. Right, so when the defect theory has a smaller R symmetry than the n equals 4 theory, so the n equals 4 had SO6. Remember our defect from last time had SO3 cross SO3. So we'll use that example, actually. So uh, the SO6 R symmetry of the n equals 4 super Yang bills will, in our example, be reduced to SO3 cross SO3. And so you might imagine that there are <coughs> operators which transform under SO6 in some representation, but which somehow find a way to be singlets under SO3 cross SO3. And those are the operators whose expectation value can be non-zero. Uh, 
and one can have a one-point function. So we'll look a little bit at the details of this in a, in a while. Uh, okay, uh, so what about the other implications of uh, the conformal symmetry? Uh, for operators in the defect, they don't really care much about the bulk. Well, they do, they interact with the bulk, but the constraints of conformal invariance are just those uh, constraints of the conformal invariance of the defect. So for two-point functions and three-point functions of defect operators, they have the same constraints as they would in a normal conformal field theory, in that the two-point functions are completely determined by some constants, right? They're no the normalization of the operator uh, plus the conformal dimensions of the operator and three-point functions by those same conformal dimensions and uh, some other uh, constants that are, in a sense, like generalized coupling constants. So the usual uh, technology of conformal field theory for defect operators is still more or less there. But for stuff outside of the defect, it's, of course, messed up by the reduction of the symmetry. So, for example... Uh, well, there are two things, uh, say a correlation for two-point functions, a correlation function of a bulk operator with a defect operator. And I guess we could put the origin on the defect, so this equation makes sense. So it has something that depends on normalizations, of course. And then it goes like the distance of the bulk operator from the defect. So that difference. And then uh, there's the distance between the two operators, which I'll call x mu, x mu, uh, to the power of delta j hat. So this scales in the same way, uh, in a sense, with the sum of the two uh, uh, conformal dimensions, but the coordinate dependence is split up in this funny way. And this coordinate dependence is given by conformal symmetry, so it is fixed like this. Uh, And then the bulk bulk operator let's say points x and x prime. First of all, the new thing here is they don't actually have to be orthogonal if they have different conformal dimensions anymore. And the coordinate dependence looks something like this. Uh, down here, I'll put their distances from the defect. And then this function of xi, xi is a scale invariant uh, thing that one makes out of coordinates. That looks like this. Just the distance squared between the points divided by these things. Now, of course, far away from the defect. So, for example, if x minus x prime is much, much less than, than uh, y or y prime, this should find a way to go back to the bulk usual scaling relation. So that will tell you something about the asymptotics of this function, but otherwise it isn't actually fixed by conformal symmetry here. Okay, so those are just the few words about defect conformal field theory.
Uh, now let us move over to Super Yang Mills theory and talk about a few specific operators. So the operators of great interest there, the ones that have been sort of the laboratory for doing all sorts of things, including the very first checks of n equals of the ADS CFT duality, are the so-called chiral primary operators. So these operators uh, in n equals four have uh, protected uh, conformal dimensions. So that in the strong coupling limit, their conformal dimensions stay small. And what the operators are dual to is modes of the supergraviton on the ADS side uh, of, of the duality. Uh, and in particular, the simplest ones are just made out of scalar fields, and they're the ones that are studied the most. So let me talk about them a little bit. So what these chiral primaries are is what you do is you take a trace of a product of the scalar fields at the same point. vacuum expectation value of that trace. Let me make more room here, because I will need it. <coughs> the engineering dimension of a scalar field is one. So at the tree level, this is a dimension delta operator if the product has delta different scalar fields. And these are known to not get radiative corrections to their anomalous dimension. Well, we have to do a few things to them first. First of all, one should completely, one should make this uh, irreducible representation of uh, the SO6 symmetry, a particular irreducible representation. That representation is gotten by completely symmetrizing in these indices and subtracting all of the traces. So let me do that by contracting it with a completely symmetric traceless tensor, which I call CI, I1 up to I delta, and then sum over I1 up to I delta. Okay, so that projects onto some state, some uh, 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 state in a uh, particular representation, irreducible representation of SO6. And that's, uh, then this operator should be normalized a little better than this. So let me right now write down the normalization in the only place where I have space left, which is here. Right there, okay. Uh, so this normalization is normalized so that if I take these tensors for different labels. They're just unit normalized like this, orthonormalized. And then without the defect, 
the two-point function of two of these operators is just given by delta ij over the distance between them to the power delta i plus delta j, which must be the same. So this delta ij to emphasize that the conformal dimensions must also be the same. Let me write it like this. Right, so they're normalized, so the operators have to be the same. That actually comes from the condition above, really. But then also the conformal dimensions have to be the same. Right? And these operators, these things are special to a given conformal dimension. And this is a delta here, not an A. Ah. OK, and there are lots of these states. How many values does I have? Well, it's the number of uh, uh, traceless, completely symmetric, completely traceless tensors. And you can count them up. I don't actually remember how you do this counting, but I know I've done it at one point and checked this formula. So this index big I and big J run over this many values for whatever delta is. So if delta, you can check it like a physicist would. If delta equals 1, there's, this is number is 1. If delta equals 2, right, it should be uh, 7 times 6 should be 21. Well, anyway, you can check it like that and convince yourself that it's right. But I think I've actually done the real derivation of it at one point or another. Uh, you just have to count the number of symmetric, traceless, completely traceless tensors. So these things don't get quantum corrections. In other words, this equation is independent of lambda, and it is really independent of lambda. The lambda dependence in the normalization here is it for the coupling constant dependence of this operator. I actually don't remember if this lambda dependence is... Uh, is the full thing or just the large n limit? We will only really use it in the large n limit, so it doesn't matter much to us. But that fact I can't remember about this normalization, and I didn't have time to check it. Uh, it could be that there are 1 over n corrections to the normalization. In any case, if there are, this number should be adjusted, so this is exact at all orders in 1 over n, as well as in the leading order. the Tuft coupling. Okay, so this is n equals 4. It has a Tuft coupling. n doesn't seem to have appeared there, so... Uh, 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 just some flavor of the argument as to why the dimension doesn't renormalize. So this is a so-called chiral primary operator. So in a superconformal algebra, the primary operators are, the, are those which commute with the S operators, right? The S supersymmetry generators. So there are two bunches of supersymmetry generators. There are uh, Qs, and then the commutator of Qs with uh, conformal transformation makes Ss. That's the only way to make a conformal algebra. So there's a mirror of all of the supercharges called Ss. S's behave like lowering operators for conformal dimension. A primary operator is defined as the one that uh, has the lowest possible conformal dimension. So a superconformal primary operator 
commutes with all of the S's. And then a chiral primary besides this. So this means it has the smallest possible conformal dimension. It's at the bottom of a tower of a whole bunch of descendants that you get by commuting it with Q's and, uh, and derivative operators and things like that, Q's and P's. Uh, a chiral primary operator also commutes with some of the Q's. Not all of the Q's. It's not allowed to commute with all of the Q's because then it couldn't be raised at all and then it basically, uh, I think, has to be the unit operator. But some of the Q's, so some of the Q's uh, don't commute with it and they generate descendants, but some of them commute like this. And in the case of chiral primaries, it's half of the Q's. So they're basically half BPS operators. And then just schematically, you go to the conformal algebra. And you remember that an S and a Q have the anti-commutator, have an anti-commutator which contains in it uh, generators of the R symmetry. I'm not going to write indices here, so this is a bit schematic, but it'll be enough for our the level of our argument anyway. Plus generators of the spin, if the object has spin. And then plus delta, the dilatation operator, I guess I should call it D. So in the superconformal algebra, there is an anti-commutator, something like that. And then all we do is take uh, this equation and anti-commute it with S. So S with operator with Q, A. For some A's is equal to zero, some but not all. Use the Jacobi identity. The Jacobi identity equates this to two other double commutators. Right, one of them has O with S, which is zero already, and the other one has S with Q, has this stuff, and that tells us that our operator with T plus sigma plus delta equals zero, at least for some components. Right, we have some components of this index on Q, it's an R symmetry index for which this should be zero, and other components for which it's unconstrained. And here the other S has also an R symmetry index, yes? So T is the generators of the R symmetry. Sigma is the generators of spin symmetry. So here I'm actually considering scalar fields. So they're singlets of the spin, so we can ignore the spin, actually, for scalars. The commutator of this, this should have been D, of course, and this would be a square bracket. The commutator of this with O gives its conformal dimension. And then the only way for this to be zero is if the eigenvalues of some commutators of T with O, some components, cancel the conformal dimension. And the T quantum numbers of O are of course fixed by the Lie algebra of the R symmetry group. And they're integers. And so the only way that this will work out in the end is if D is basically equal to those integers. And so here, one of those integers is the total number of fields here. And in fact, that's the relevant one. So D has to be equal to this delta here, which is the number of fields. And this really, uh, if you assume this algebra survives independently of interactions, then 
fixes the conformal dimension of these half BPS operators. So it's an algebraic argument like that. You don't need to draw any Feynman diagrams, although I have seen in early ADSCFT papers where people actually confirmed this to one loop using Feynman diagrams and so on. Uh, uh, maybe just an example to make sure that it works, but uh, this algebraic property is there if the algebra is there. And one can assume that it's there if the quantum field theory is properly defined uh, independently of perturbation theory. A is an R symmetry index, but of course there should be spinner indices. So there should be spinner indices here, and this should be true for all of the spinner indices. And of course they come here onto the spin operator. T doesn't have spin, so it's like a delta function or unit matrix, whatever it is in the spinner indices, and so is D. Uh, a is a R symmetry index. Right, and so for some values of A, so they come on this thing and not here, and not here. This is kind of unit matrix in everything, the dilatation operator. And so for a few of these, this has to be true. And it can't be true for all of them, or, or else there's just no solution of this equation. Right, and the, actually the biggest number it can be true for is half, half of the supercharges. So two out of four of the Qs. Okay. So that's a chiral primary operator. I'm going to be interested in some properties of it. Uh, and in particular, I will need some I would like to know for our specific uh, discussion here whether there are any chiral primary operators, which of course transform now nicely under SO6 somehow, whether any of them are SO3 cross SO3 invariant. Okay, now that might, figuring that out might look like a tall order, but it's not so bad. The way to do it is to look at the spherical harmonics, the SO6 spherical harmonics, and ask if any of them are SO3 cross SO3 invariant. Now, SO6 spherical harmonics, as you might imagine, are made out of these guys. And this index I parameterizes the different harmonics for a given level of SO3, or SO6, sorry, not SO3, SO6. So I can take you through a little exercise in SO6 harmonics, since I should show you how to do something here. Let me show you that, at least. Uh, mainly because, well, it could be very useful for you. You might want to use it somewhere else, so let's see. Uh, so an SO6 spherical harmonic One constructs from one of these tensors like this. Well, it's yi, and it depends on the coordinates, which I'll call x hat, of the five sphere. And then it has this tensor in it. And then it just has unit vectors, which you can think of as six-dimensional vectors in six-dimensional space with unit magnitude. So these numbers run from one to six, as they should. Where x i hat x i hat summed over i from one to six is equal to one. Okay, so there are our uh, SO6 spherical harmonics. Of course, we might want to know what these tensors are. 
These tensors actually are not that hard to construct for delta equals 1, delta equals 2, delta <coughs> equals 3, but in general, they could be complicated. So uh, let me sort of take, walk you through what we need to find out, to find out the bits that we actually need to know about them. Okay, so let me uh, begin with this SO6 harmonic and talk about it a little bit. How would I, for example, how would I find it explicitly? Well, if I use the fact that C is traceless and completely symmetric, I can derive an equation that this satisfies. If you take the gradient operator in six dimensions, operate it on the unit vector, of course that's something we can do. That should equal one over something with the units of length, one over x, times this sort of transverse projection operator. Using that, I can operate it on here. So it operates on all these things, and then it makes something like a trace and some con contractions with x hat. I can figure out what those are. It generates a mess, of course, but a controllable mess. But then what I really want to do is operate it again to make a Laplacian on R6. And if I do that in here and use the normalization of C, I can actually show that the Laplacian operating on this yi just gives some constants times yi back again. And those constants are delta times delta plus 4 over x squared times yi or delta is the delta of i, maybe, uh, well, I'll, I'll write delta of i, but it's just the number of uh, x's in this y. So it's rather easy to derive this formula by just knowing the properties of the c, ci. Okay, then, Let me do the following. Let me rewrite the Laplacian on R6 in polar coordinates. In order to get the Laplacian on, on, uh, on SO5, on the five sphere, on S5, sorry. So this Laplacian, I can write in polar coordinates. There's a radial derivative, which is one over radius to the fifth d by d radius, I'll call radius just x, of radius to the fifth times d by dx. I guess you know this is there, and I guess it should have a minus sign in front of it. I guess you know uh, that x to the fifth is there, you know, because that's the volume measure in polar coordinates on six-dimensional space. It should be radius to the fifth times dr, and then times angle in integrations. So you know that this is here. And then there's the angular momentum part. Which is going to look like that. And these angular momenta. Oops, I don't want to erase this. Should have some uh, terrible expression in uh, polar coordinates. But in Cartesian coordinates, they just minus i, this i is the square root of minus 1, it's not that i, times xi del j minus xj del i. Right? Just the angular momentum operator in six dimensions. So square it, sum up over the indices, and you get this. That's what goes here, of course. So this is the Laplacian in spherical coordinates. <coughs> 
Then this equation tells us, well, the y's don't depend on this x. So this equation tells us that the y is an eigenvalue of this Laplacian. That this Lij squared on yi is equal to this delta times delta plus 4 of yi. So there. Using a fairly naive reasoning, one has arrived at this equation, that the spherical harmonics are eigenvalues of this Laplace operator, eigenfunctions, and the eigenvalues are the delta times delta plus 4. There might be more elegant ways to get here. I don't know. I have a fairly simple way of thinking about these things, which uh, Okay, then what? Well, then, of course, this is a Laplacian on the phi sphere. I could take our coordinatization of the phi sphere and write the Laplacian a different way. Of course, that'll be a huge mess generically, but I just want to extract something fairly simple out of it. So let me take uh, the metric of the phi sphere, the one that we talked about yesterday. So remember, we wrote the phi sphere as two, two spheres fibered over an interval. So that had a metric that looked like this. Right, plus co squared. So the thing that lives on the interval, psi, deep psi squared, uh, co squared psi times uh, the metric in, say, polar coordinates of one of the S2s, and then sine squared psi times the metric and polar coordinates of the other S2. Like that. And I've done this with a specific purpose in mind. And that said, I would like to ask, are there yi's that are invariant under SO3 cross SO3? The question I was beginning to ask over there. And to be invariant under SO3 cross SO3 in these coordinates would mean that they're independent of theta and phi and theta tilde and phi tilde. Right? Then they're SO3 cross SO3 invariant. And so they just depend on this coordinate psi. So are there solutions of this equation that just depend on the coordinate psi? This Laplacian on this space, if it's just for psi, I can write quite easily. Well, actually, you could write the whole Laplacian quite easily in these coordinates and, and find the general ones, and I invite you to do that, but I'm not going to do it here. I'm just going to now focus on the specific question. Can I solve this equation with a y that just depends on psi? So I have to put the equation in this coordinate system, and of course here I have the metric explicitly, so I can write the Laplacian. That's no, no problem. Uh, so let me write down the Laplace equation. That Okay, so there's the Laplacian, the part of it I'm interested in. It's really no problem to write down the rest, but I won't bother here. So this operating on y, i, should give minus delta times delta plus 4 times y, i. And there's a differential equation in one variable which we can try to solve. Still looks a little bit ugly, but not that ugly. It's sort of uh, controllable ugliness. Uh, in fact, in playing around and looking for a way to solve it, I like to write it as an equation for a complex variable z. So to z is e to the 2i psi, where psi is that coordinate there. Right? If I do that, 
and play around with the equation. Of course, uh, d by d psi is something like, uh, uh, let's see, dz by d psi. So that's 2iz d by dz in the complex coordinates. The derivative operator looks like that. And sine squared and cos squared, you can write in terms of z's also easily, some nice functions. And turn this differential equation into something else. And I'll just write for you the something else. It's not that many steps. It, turns, it collapses into something quite nice. What's basically a harmonic oscillator equation. that anybody can solve. Right, so the solution of this equation which I've normalized somehow here. I want to normalize them. Well, I want to normalize them so they're real spherical harmonics. So it has something to do with their integral over the sphere and so on, which is easy to do because they'll depend only on one of the variables. So z by dz, you think of this as d by e log z. And then, of course, the Solutions are just e to the plus or minus this 1 plus delta over 2 times log z, or z to the plus or minus 1 plus delta over 2. And I've written, and I want these to be, uh, there are of course two solutions, but there's uh, uh, constraints on these solutions that they should be well behaved over the range of z, particularly at the limits. And the limits are at z equals 1 and z equals minus 1. So I've written the solution which is well behaved at z equals 1. And then this will be well behaved also at z equals minus 1, only if delta is even. If delta is odd, these don't cancel at z equals minus 1, and uh, this is singular there, right? The denominator is singular at both z is 1 and minus 1. The numerator is 0 at z equals 1 automatically. I've taken the linear combination of solutions for that. z equals minus 1 basically gives a quantization condition for delta. The delta is an even integer. So the boundary conditions here tell you delta is an even integer. For z close to 1, you could see it's OK. Right? For z close to minus 1, this square root of minus 1 to the power delta should actually go to minus 1. Uh, well, should, uh, well, should behave so that this numerator is also 0. And that will only happen when it's not a branch cut, so when delta is an uh, even integer. And then you could see that you could tailor expand this. And actually, it looks a lot like an SU2 character. For those of you who know what an SU2 character is, it, it really looks a lot like that. So our y i of, of well, z so far is equal to, well, there's all this normalization stuff in front. And then Z's, there's something with z to the delta over 2 plus z to the delta over 2 minus 1 and then all the way out to z to the minus delta over 2. Looks like that. <laughs> 
Back in terms of the coordinates of the phi sphere, so this special spherical harmonic, the function of psi, turns out to look like this. So 2 to the delta minus 1 over 2 down here. Uh, sorry, it's not 2. It's actually z. Oh, what's z? Oh. Okay, let me, let me write this over again. I'm sorry. If you're taking notes, I know I'm messing you up here. Uh, okay, it's uh, 2 plus delta factorial. Downstairs is 2 to the power delta plus 1 over 2. Then there's some square roots of delta plus 1, delta plus 2. And then there's a sum, basically this sum, p equals 0 to delta over 2, specialized to delta is even, minus 1 to the p, sine to the delta minus 2p of psi, cosine to the power 2p of psi, divided by 2p plus 1 factorial, 1 plus delta minus 2p factorial. Basically just what you get. Basically mirroring the sum upstairs, but now with z equals e to the 2i psi and rewritten in terms of sines and cosines. So there's a, well, uh, there's a spherical harmonic. Notice that we found only one, and only when delta is even. Why only one? Why not this huge number here? Just to see if you're awake. Someone tell me, why did we only find one? I told you that I should have this many. We solved, we solved, we solved. We had a condition here that they're non-singular, and that left us only one, and only when delta is even. Why is that? Well, I required it's only a function of psi. So this is the SO3 cross SO3 invariant one, and the result is there's only one. Out of all that pile of spherical harmonics, for a given delta, there's only one, and only when delta is even. When delta is odd, there's none. So let's test that in our physicist way. Phi i of x. Is that ever going to be SO3 cross SO3 invariant? No, because the SO3s act on the i's, right? <laughs> so when delta equals 1, there is no invariant. When delta equals 2, is there an invariant? Well, subtract the trace. It's already a little bit harder to see, but our result here says yes, it must be. You know, something like cosine of psi. Whatever you get by truncating this where delta equals 2, it's the sum from 0 to 1. Well, there's two terms. But. Okay, so these are our SO3 cross SO3 invariant spherical harmonics. It's nice that we have them because now we know which chiral primaries are going to survive in our defect conformal field theory. They're the ones that are contracted with the CI for this conformal primary operator. In fact, what's going to happen is I'm going to have things that are non-zero in only one of the SO3s. So these are only going to have indices that go from 1 to 3, not 1 to 6. That I will get over here by simply putting psi equal to 0. So that explicitly gives me the CI that I need, in a sense, psi equals 0. That tells me what this spherical harmonic will be. 
Okay. Uh, I'm not half done, uh, but I have come up to a rather natural place to give you a rest. So why don't I do that now? Five to ten minutes and we'll resume. Okay, so let me try in the next uh, 45 minutes to uh, show you what I will use this for. So I'd like to go back to our defect field theory that we talked about last time. Remember what it was and then do something to it and then do some calculations. So that's the order of things here. So uh, maybe we could save, uh, well, actually, I probably won't have space to save this guy. So we did this calculation, and we'll use this guy specifically at zero. So you know exactly what this number is if you put psi equal to zero, and it will appear in a formula at some point later on. So what I'd like to do is go back to the D3, D5 brain system, which was our defect conformal field theory. So remember what it looked like. Picture something like this. our ADS5 space bifurcated by an ADS4 space which is part of the world volume of a D5 brain. The ADS5 space of course is ADS5 and then there should be a 5 sphere S5 and the most symmetric configuration of this uh, D5 brain had a world volume, which is ADS4, which is what is drawn here, and then it wraps a two-sphere on ADS5. Now what I would like to do is generalize this construction a little bit in a direction uh, that's a little different from what we did before. So what we did last time is realize that this D5 brain might look like a D7 brain if there were enough gauge fields around. And we introduced enough gauge fields to do that. And these were world volume gauge fields of the brain. Uh, all right, electric and magnetic fields that, which live on the ADS part here. This time I'm going to introduce a gauge field on this other part and it will do something. It's not a lot that it does, but it will do something. But it will leave me with a super conformal field theory, actually. The other generalization didn't, right? Remember in the other case when we introduced a real magnetic field, for example, in the field theory, the bosons and the fermions at different Landau levels. So immediately that tells you it's not super symmetric anymore. Also, there's a magnetic field that has a scale. It's not conformally invariant. So you're off uh, away from the most symmetric solutions. And we found that those solutions are various truncated versions of this D5 brain and then blown up D5 brains to make D7 brains and so on. So we even kind of knew what those solutions were. On the field theory side, we also kind of understood. <coughs> you have these fields in the supermultiplet, and then in that field theory, you just make a state which isn't symmetric. Right? You fill up the charges to some Fermi level, you put a magnetic field, you can think of that as just a different state of that theory. Uh, so those things we sort of had under control. Now what I would like to do is, uh, is uh, remember something from a study of D-brains, and that's that D5 
D3 brains can end on D5 brains. And I want to look at the following possibility. So I have a bunch of D3 brains, which I would use to make, uh, to do ADS-CFT and some limit. A D5 brain here. Here, perhaps I have N D3 brains. Some of them end on the D5 brain. So on the other side, say K of them end, I have N minus K D3 brains. So this is D5 brain. The way to let K3 brains end on the D5 brain is it needs to carry a magnetic flux in the two directions of the D5 brain that aren't in the direction of the D3s. It needs K units of magnetic flux. Over here, what that will be is, well, there's two halves of the space. On this side, on the gravity side, what does this look like? The number of D3 brains is recorded by the Ramond-Ramond flux. Right, the Ramond-Ramond flux in the solution. So in a sense, the space is divided into two halves, which have different amounts of Ramond-Ramond flux. One has n units, the other one has n minus k units. The D5 brain that's embedded here, it also has to have magnetic flux. That magnetic flux is exactly on this two sphere. So on this two sphere, which sits on the S5, remember I was drawing it something like this. Now it has k units of u1 magnetic flux, basically a Dirac monopole bundle sitting well, Yu Wu Yang bundle, I guess it should probably be called. It describes a Dirac monopole sitting inside the sphere. Wu Yang bundle with uh, K units of flux. That K units of flux will actually do something for us. Let me leave this guy here for a So I'll erase this. And that's because when we uh, study the D3 brains, there's a D3, D5 system. When we study the D5 system, remember it had an action something like this. Here's the induced metric of the embedding of it. So this is still in a probe brain limit. We might have only one D5 brain, for example. Uh, so to find his geometry, we should extremize the Born-Infeld action. And then there was this Chern-Simons term here. And then what we did yesterday for the D5 brain, as far as it goes, the Chern-Simons term didn't do anything. And that's because the C4 here has to be integrated on the ADS4. And we didn't have any flux on the two sphere. So that term was trivial in what we did last time. It became non-trivial for the D7 brain, but for the D5 brain, it was trivial. Right? It's in fact what did everything for us for the D7 brain. For the D5 brain, it did nothing. But today is different because now we have a flux on the two sphere. So C4 integrated on ADS4 and F integrated over the two sphere does something. And that something is still something highly symmetric. In fact, it doesn't ruin the superconformal symmetry. It gives us something with the same symmetry that we had before when the flux wasn't there. It's just a slightly different configuration. 
slightly different shape of the embedding. What the shape looks like is something like this. I can't really draw it in this box. What happens is like this. What we had before was, say, between r equals infinity, r equals 0, a brain suspended like this, where this was the direction transverse to the brain we call the z direction, say. All right, so x, y, and t are all in this up and down direction, and z is in right, the right and left direction. Now, with this thing added, the most symmetric bra brain embedding, well, actually, this thing makes a source for this coordinate z. And the solution of the equation of the motion with that source means z has to be non-trivial somehow. And what it comes out to is k, the number of units of magnetic flux, divided by the radius. So now the world volume of our d7 brain, it kind of lays down as you come down in r. It looks more like this. And approaches the Poincaré horizon only way asymptotically way over on the left for z going to infinity. So this is what the world volume looks like in this picture. But actually, it's still ADS. It's a way of fitting ADS in the space where the ADS has a slightly different curvature, radius of curvature. That's all that happens. This constant, the one, if you plug it into the equations, gives something with a slightly scaled radius of curvature. It's no longer just root lambda alpha prime, the radius of curvature squared of the embedded D brain, right? That's what it would inherit from the background, but it's slightly bigger than that. It has, I think, a factor of one plus k squared over and above that. We'll never may really make use of that fact, but it is sort of pictorially what happens. So you have something with a bigger radius. How does it fit? Well, you kind of have to fold it. <coughs> you can fold it in a way that still has all of the symmetries. And so this should still be dual to a superconformal field theory. On the field theory side, none of the symmetries have disappeared. It's still ADS4 cross S2. So it still has the same R symmetries, the same Poincaré symmetry, still has conformal invariance. So therefore superconformal invariance, basically all of the same symmetries on the field theory side. So we still have this defect CFT, except for one very interesting difference. And that's, well, remember the number of units of Ramon de Ramon flux, it's equal to n. It fixes the n in the gauge group of the n equals 4 super Yang mills. So in this defect field theory, and the bulk is living n equals 4 super Yang mills, on this side it has sun gauge group, and on this side it has sun minus k gauge group, and the defect is a boundary between regions where the gauge field has different, different gauge groups. What lives on the defect? I actually no longer know what lives on the defect. In the previous thing, where these were the same, uh, we knew this was a hypermultiplet, a chiral hypermultiplet of the reduced, of the super two plus one dimensional supersymmetry. Uh, it transformed as a bifundamental, one with the charge of the gauge fields that live on the defect, and the other as a fundamental representation under SUN. Now I'm actually not too sure how to fit these things together. I would say that's an open problem to construct the defect field theory here. There is some literature, I'll give you a reference uh, shortly, uh, probably the most advanced paper in this business, uh, but uh, really putting together what the defect field theory would do in a precise way, uh, one should be guided by symmetry, 
But the gauge symmetries are difficult. I'm not sure. It could be just the defect field theory we talked about yesterday with the smaller one of the two gauge groups. It could be that. Uh, that would be a reasonable guess, but uh, I'm not completely sure of that. So here I've, kind of, I've lost track a little bit of what the dual field theory is and that I'm not sure what it is on the defect. Going to have to ask questions then which don't matter. Where, where this fact doesn't matter. Uh, in fact, I'd like to construct the dual field theory a little bit to talk about what it should look like. What I'm going to do here is work in a regime where K is large, and I'm going to do that because some things become computable. In fact, it's rather interesting to look at this. In a regime where root lambda is much less than k, well, I can do that perturbation theory if lambda is really small and k is an integer. But indeed, I'll be able to go to the string side and make k big. And I could make k big as long as it's less than n. And of course, if n is infinite, there's lots of space for that. <laughs> so even when root lambda is big, I imagine I could make k bigger than root lambda, and still have it much less than n, and there should be a regime like this. On the gauge theory side, to do perturbation theory, I don't really need this. k doesn't have to be that big, because root lambda should be really small. On the string theory side, it's, it's a different story. There, root lambda should be big, and that means on the string theory side, k should be even bigger. I will find that there's a coupling constant that in perturbation theory is something like lambda over k squared. And of course, on the string theory side, is going to look like root lambda over k squared. So something is going to grow like, like root lambda, like it tends to do in the asymptotic expansion, the semi-classics on the string side. Uh, but it has a k squared downstairs. And I will find something that's actually expandable in this parameter. And that will be interesting. It means that one can actually compare directly the gauge theory side and the string theory side. Well, we have some, an expansion on both sides, which is controlled by the same parameter. All right, lambda should be small on one side and big on the other, but one can just assume that k squared is bigger than either one. And so this is a small parameter, and one is expanding in it. And it looks like a controlled approximation. And so here will be something we can match on both sides, perhaps. But first we have to compute something. And what would that thing be? Well, the easiest thing is a one-point function. Right? So we went through an hour of uh, technical gobbledygook, which was supposed to convince ourselves that there are one-point functions of chiral primary operators that survive here. And so let's take our chiral primary operator and calculate its one-point function in the gauge theory and then in the string theory and compare them. So on the gauge theory, I'll have to tell you how to do that. In the string theory, it's actually a rather well-worn calculation. Correlation functions of, uh, of these, exactly these chiral primary operators were the things that were... Uh, computed in the very early days of ADS-CFT by Lee Minwala and collaborators. And the two and three point functions were the things that matched on both sides. And they matched, of course, because they don't renormalize. They're lambda independent once they're properly normalized. And so they could be matched on two sides. And uh, on one side, there were boundary the boundary gravity propagators for the supergravitons in ADS-5. and uh, on the other side, they were the perturbative Feynman diagram computed in a leading order, chiral primary correlators. Okay, so that's old stuff. Then the technology for calculating uh, the correlators on the gravity side is well known, and we'll just have to adopt it to here. I will, of course, not have time for the technical details, but uh, they're well established and written down in the literature. But I should tell you how to do this on the gauge theories.
So if I want to calculate this one-point function, first of all, how would this ever get a one-point function? How could a operator in n equals 4 get a one-point function? Has to be a tadpole, right, of some kind. So how do you get a tadpole in field theory? That's right. You have to expand around the vacuum where there's a condensate. Some kind of classical solution. So let's go here and look for a classical solution. This is telling us if there's going to be a one-point function, there should be some classical solution of n equals 4 that describes this thing. So what would that be? Well, this is n equals 4 where a whole bunch of the gauge symmetry disappears. As you go from over here to over here, the gauge group gets smaller. I guess the way that we know that gauge groups get smaller, I can only think of one, and it's called the Higgs mechanism. Right? The Higgs mechanism makes gauge groups smaller. And the Higgs mechanism here would come from a condensate of something that transforms under the gauge group. So perhaps one describes this with a condensate of some kind. That condensate, uh, well, the condensate has to be different in different parts of the space. Right? So the condensate is no longer just a constant, like the old one we did an almost infinite amount of time ago, it seems, by now, when we talked about Wilson loops, we made a condensate to make W bosons. That was with a constant expectation value of phi. A constant won't do here because a constant, well, it's the same everywhere. It's not going to give us this picture. Right? We, we want one which kind of reduces the gauge symmetry as we go this way. So the appropriate condensate is something called the nonpole, which is used in boundary conformal field theory. And here it seems to work for this kind of field theory. I can't say I fully understand why it works. I just know that it does seem to work. So there is a little bit of an edge here as to why all this stuff works. It's a kind of a singular expansion. Maybe it has to be singular because it's CFT. You can't introduce scales that will smooth out singularities and so on. So in some sense it has to be. But I can't tell you that I have good intuition as to why everything works here. But anyway, let's look at it. So. So we want to condensate. Of course, condensates are solutions of the classical equations of motion. So we should write down some equations of motion. So let me do this. Let me say that in the n equals 4 theory, the gauge fields are all 0. And the fermions are all 0. And maybe some of the gauge field, or the scalar fields are excited. So with this ansatz, let me look at the equation of motion for the scalar fields. So now this is a Laplacian on uh, four-dimensional space, or four-dimensional space-time. So the equation of motion for n equals 4 for the scalar field looks something like this. In a way, there's a Laplacian, and then there's a matrix model Laplacian, in a sense, of a double commutator. And that should equal 0. And then. If these are non-zero, of course, they have an SUN charge. So one should augment this with an equation that says their SUN charge should be zero. And that's this equation. Otherwise, if this were non-zero, it would not be consistent to set these guys equal to zero. And then one would like to preserve some supersymmetry. So one would like the supersymmetry transformation of whatever phi's we come up with that solve this equation. We'd like some of their supersymmetry transformations to be zero and so on. 
Okay. So let me uh, write down a putative solution to these equations. Should also be governed by our SO3 cross SO3 symmetry. And the fact that the D-brain wraps only one of the SO3s and sits at an SO3 symmetric point in the other one. Right, so on the D-brain side, we should expect something that's completely symmetric under the second SO3. And in the first one, the SO3 should be realized in some clever way. <laughs> so how do you do that? I'll take the following field configuration. It's only actually going to work if this depends on just one coordinate. In fact, with just one coordinate, there's a way to factor this into something called a nom equation. Right? This is a second order equation, but it's in a supersymmetric theory. So actually, you can use a supersymmetry sometimes to factorize second order equations into products of first order things. And that indeed could be done here. Though I haven't done it because we'll just straightforwardly find a solution to this equation. It looks like this. So it's a function of one coordinate. And it's the coordinate that goes away from the defect. So y is the distance from the defect to the left. And I don't know which sign you'll give that. If it's to the left, you might make y negative in case, in that case I want an absolute value down here. And then into the gauge group, I will embed some SU2 matrices. And there will be three of them, right? SU2 matrices, there's three generators of SU2. So this will be for only three components of the scalar field, the first three. And these will be k by k. So phi is a big matrix. It's n by n. I will think in this k by k block up here, so this is k by k, I embed these ti's. And then I put 0 in the rest of it. And so this is in direct sum with 0 n minus k cross n minus k matrix, like that. That I would claim is a solution of this equation. OK, so two derivatives, first of all, here give 1 over y cubed, right? Two derivatives acting on this. This is just the flat space of Laplacian. So this is dy squared. Take two derivatives of y, get 1 over y cubed, and uh, perhaps a factor of 2. Take these commutators. Right? So a commutator of two phi's is an epsilon tensor times another phi. Or, or t's, sorry. You have two t's as epsilon tensor times another t. Then you have to take another commutator. Another epsilon tensor times another t. So you get two epsilon tensors and a t here. Just by symmetry, the t will have to have the same index as here. There's nothing else it could have. And the two epsilon tensors contracted together will produce a factor of 2 that you get from taking two derivatives of this d by dy. So that thing there is a solution of this equation. And then you can also check that it's a solution of this equation. And that's simply because the different, comp or the ti with ti commutes with itself. And the gradient produces something that's proportional to ti again. So this equation is also 0. Okay, so there's a classical solution. It's a little bit of a strange classical solution because it diverges as you come up to the defect. 
goes to zero asymptotically away from the defect and diverges as you come up to it. So it's like having a condensate which gets infinitely big and Higgs is away all the gauge group that's in this top corner of all of the matrix valued fields. Basically kills those degrees of freedom as you come up to the gauge up to the condensate and then on the other side uh, I mean at the defect on the other side of the defect those degrees of freedom you just set to zero forever on that side. So this is a classical field configuration that one would claim uh, characterizes a defect. Okay, well we have a condensate, so now we have a tadpole. All right, semi-classically, how do we compute correlation functions? Well, we just take this thing and plug it in the correlation function. All right, so take that field configuration up there, plug it in here. Then you just have to be good at SU2 to figure out uh, what the trace is of a whole bunch of these generators. <coughs> what you will get is something that has to be SO3 cross SO3 invariant, but which only transforms under the first, uh, in a sense, under the first SO3. The second one is set to zero. That will actually be proportional to that spherical harmonic that we calculated before evaluated at psi equals zero. So that'll just give a constant in front of everything and then the rest is the gymnastics of taking this trace and so you can plug that in and uh, get the one point function. So let me write down our prediction for the one point function from perturbation theory. So first of all, there's this yi of zero. And then stuff that comes from the normalization. All right, we had these in the normalization, this thing over here. Don't know if this eight, maybe this should have been two. See, eight in my notes, but uh, it seems to turn into two over here. I don't remember anything else. That, well, actually, no, it could have, it, there could have been some factors of two with the other stuff. And so the trace over the t's gives k squared minus one to the, fa to the power delta over two. Remember, delta has to be even for this to survive, otherwise this guy is just zero. Then there's another k, and then there's one over this distance y to the power of delta, and this only works when delta is even. Starting with two, of course it doesn't make any sense when delta is equal to zero. Okay, so there's our perturbative calculation of a one-point function. Okay, now let me go to the string side. Can we calculate it over there? It's actually pretty easy to calculate it over here. What I've outlined, I think you could sit down and fill in all the details in about half an hour, and there you have the calculation. You can, you can add, and it has been done actually, I'll tell you about it. Uh, so you can actually add corrections to this, but in the leading order, of course, in weak coupling, you just plug in the classical solution. Okay? Weak coupling, after all, is a semi-classical limit, expanding about a semi-classical limit, and if there's a classical solution, the first order is just plugging in the classical solution. And that's what's been done and that's what gets this. So this is just the classical solution plugged into there. Nothing more, nothing less. It can be corrected using Feynman diagrams and that's of course a loop, one loop approximation. So that can be done systematically. 
by expanding around the classical solution. Uh, there's a well-developed technology for doing that. And in fact, here it has been done. But let me talk a little bit. I don't have time to do the details here. Maybe lucky for you or maybe lucky for me too, because uh, they're a little bit difficult. But let me talk about what to do on the string side. So there one wants to calculate a one-point function of the field theory operator. So what you have to do is, first of all, identify that mode of the type 2b superstring on this background, which is dual to the chiral primary operator. And that has been done. Here what helps a lot is you know all of the symmetries of the operator, and you know that it's protected. And so you know on the gravity side it has to be one of the low energy degrees of freedom, right? It doesn't get quantum corrections to its anomalous dimension, which is like the, in a sense, the ADS energy on the gravity side. Uh, and so you know what that operator is over there. In fact, the dual is, uh, so let me write this down in words. Right, so it's a scalar which has uh, certain transformation properties under SO6. So it's a scalar mode of the supergraviton. And then the SO6 comes from a kind of a Kaluza Klein reduction on the five sphere. Among the linearized, the sort of fluctuations of the ADS background, if you look at the metric fluctuation, the ADS5 part of the metric, that scalar is called S, and it appears like this. So H is a fluctuation, G is the background. Is G alpha beta. Again, this is a fluctuation of the metric on the phi sphere. This is the background metric on the phi sphere. S is the scalar fluctuation. So this S here is the mode that is dual to the scalar composite scalar field that we're talking about. And one should expand it in SO5, SO6 spherical harmonics to get all these levels. And so the spherical harmonics will come in naturally. And there's one more place where it lives, and that's in the Ramon Ramon four form field on the ADS side, for example. Right, so it lives in the fluctuations about the background, something like that. And these formulas are just to show you, uh, to make plausible for you where it comes from, because I'm not really going to use them. It's a long story then, so what do you do with these? Well, you identify the mode, you find the scalar wave equation, which is which governs their dynamics on the ADS5 cross S5 space. You need the green function for that scalar wave equation, so all of these things are known. Then what you do in this picture, remember we had the D brain leaning over like this, is you put a source on the boundary. You have a boundary to bulk propagator which is the green function for that scalar mode. It couples, well, normally, if you're going to calculate a correlator, two-point correlator of these things, 
you would come back to the boundary to the position of another source but here this is a one-point function so where this thing goes is to well the thing that allows you to have one-point functions down to the d5 brain on the d5 brain you have to identify the vertex operators that couple this mode to the d5 brain the technology for doing that is known i'm not going to review it for you but the things like that are known So those vertex operators are in some perturbations of the D-brain action, the Born-Infeld action, with embedding plus delta embedding. The delta embedding is uh, basically from the fluctuations of the background of this source. Okay, so this appears in, in there. Gives you the vertex operators, and then you attach this here, and then you integrate it over the world volume of the D5-brain, and that gives you the one-point function. So this is all fairly straightforward stuff. Nothing magic. All the steps are fairly well known. Uh, actually, in the limit that we're interested in, large root lam large lambda over, pardon me, small lambda over k squared, this integration actually localizes to where this should be perpendicular in some sense. You can evaluate it uh, in a, the integral by a saddle point technique, and it localizes like that. So when you do that, do all of that, the expectation value of the one-point function, or the one-point function comes out like this. It has basically all the same things in it. But actually, it gives an expression that you can expand in k, in, sorry, root lambda over k squared, or root lambda over k. So it has this, which actually matches this formula up here when k is large. Notice when k is large, you have to neglect this one, but then the coefficient here and here is just identical. Remember here, delta has to be even again, simply because the spherical harmonic is zero otherwise. And you actually get a few terms in this expansion. And again, that's from uh, the leading order is just a geodesic equation here. Uh, if you evaluate the integral over the volume of the D-brain here, uh, using a saddle point technique, the fluctuations give the next order. And in principle, all orders are in there. And so you have higher and higher orders here that you can check. So not only does this give something which actually matches beautifully, gauge theory side to string side, it also gives a prediction for what you should find if you calculate the next order up here because it is just perturbative in lambda on this side. Kind of interesting that the string side, which is good for large lambda, is giving you something that's perturbative in lambda. But anyway, it's been set up that way. And so one could do the calculation on this side. Now, sooner or later, a loop calculation on the gauge theory side is going to have to know what the stuff that lives on the defect is. And remember our discussion, we don't really know that. Might conjecture that it's something like the stuff with k equals zero, 
maybe with a reduced size gauge group, but uh, I think that's an open question whether it's really like that or whether it's maybe like that with other operators or, or something. Uh, it is still determined by symmetry. It's just I think no one's ever really looked into what it should be like. But anyway, uh, it was noticed by somebody that you could do this next order without really knowing the details of the defect theory. It depends only on some loop diagrams in, in the bulk away from the defect. Somehow the defect theory only will turn on in the next order. And so this calculation was done on the gauge theory side, and actually this coefficient has now been, after a long struggle with uh, supersymmetric regularization of the integrals, this coefficient indeed has been reproduced. And this was done by the Copenhagen group. And the most advanced version of this you can find in this paper on the archive, which is already a year ago. And indeed, the biggest trick there was to find uh, a way to regulate Feynman diagrams that preserve the supersymmetry, actually, right? You can't regulate and preserve conformal symmetry, but you could, with hard work, try to preserve supersymmetry, and that's indeed what they did. Yes? This is k squared here. Yeah. Uh, is that what you mean? Delta plus a half, there was a K here. So if you take large K, this is K to the delta. Uh, 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 maybe that's supposed to be plus one. Yeah, I think that's supposed to be plus one, sorry. I have in my notes a half, but it can't be right. <laughs> so, because I know that these match. And here the K, this K just comes from group theory and then you have this coupling constant. Okay, so this is my punchline that these things match and in fact continue to match when you calculate corrections. It would be wonderful to calculate more corrections or to use some imagination and find something else to calculate here, like two-point function or something like that. Also, it would be really interesting to study the defect field theory to understand what it is like in this case. Uh, that you would need to push this calculation to higher order, the gauge theory calculation, to compare with this, which you can derive to higher orders. Uh, and all of these things are an open problem, which I, I actually uh, consider quite interesting uh, these days. So with that, I guess it's come time to conclude. So uh, just in summary, where have we been? We talked about gauge theories in large N. We gave the hand-waving derivation of ADS CFT. Then we applied it to a kind of a physics-y approach to Wilson loops, used it to compute some Wilson loops, well, really some propagators of W bosons in which the Wilson loop played a role, but that gave us a way to estimate the Wilson loops, especially for some special trajectories of the bosons, which we also found a physics-y way to force on the boson, put it in an electric field, you know, something like that. Uh, from there, we introduced probe brains. And here I only did one simple example of probe brains. There is a whole bunch of them, a whole zoo of probe brains that are used for this and that. But I think uh, to study an example, especially a fairly well-behaved one, is probably pedagogically the best thing to do. So we introduced probe brains. We did some condensed matter type of physics with them. right? put in a charge density, a magnetic field, studied the phase diagram, uh, talked about how the probe brains respond to this environment. 
modif how it modifies the geometry, talked about what the states on the gauge theory side look like. So different states on the gauge theory side to di equals different configurations of the probe brain. Uh, and then we came back here to talk a little bit more about defect conformal field theory in the presence of a probe brain and uh, some uh, interesting things you could do like calculate one-point functions. And with that, I thank you.